is one of our topics that was suggested after a case discussion that we had had in this forum not so long ago. It is a brief didactic, so it's a general overview of sleep medication. So we're not going into too much detail uh, for any of them. My objectives for today are to list our available sleep medications, describe the common mechanisms of action. I did want to draw some comparisons in looking at the pharmacology of these agents and discuss the scenarios where they're found to be most effective. So um, I did utilize the American Academy of Sleep Medicine's practice guidelines um, for where they're suggesting that these medications be used. So taking a step back, insomnia is estimated to have a prevalence between 20 and 50%. Um, so that includes chronic insomnia or acute. Um, so individuals that are having short-term difficulties or long-term difficulties. Interestingly, there has been a suggestion that maybe sleep problems will even be more pronounced than that, especially in light of the pandemic with um, a number of additional stressors, changes in substance use disorder, as well as changes in, in individuals' activity levels. Um, so we may see a shift in those prevalence in the coming years as they go back and look at the data. So something you're likely to see and maybe more likely to encounter now. A couple things um, to keep in mind, comorbidities are really common. I am focusing just on insomnia here. We'll pull in a couple different comorbidities, um, but just in order to provide the full overview and keep it within our didactic yeah. frame, um, I, I did need to, to try to focus in a little bit. But there are a tremendous number of mental health and medical comorbidities with insomnia. And in patients who develop insomnia, it can increase the risk for development of other conditions, um, including things like cardiovascular disease. So trying to keep our integrated care theme, there really can be a, a mutually non-beneficial relationship if these conditions are uncontrolled. So to jump right into sleep considerations. So looking at both acute or chronic, most of the recommendations that I'm gonna be um, going through today are for patients with chronic insomnia. So insomnia that's been sticking around for about a month. Um, although there is one set of medications that really look to be encouraged more for acute insomnia. So we will hit on those toward the end of, of our discussion. With the sleep concerns and insomnia, the three buckets that we're looking at are patients that have difficulty falling asleep, those that have difficulty staying asleep, and those that have early morning wakenings. In the treatment recommendations, they really focus on those first two areas. So for, for patients that have difficulty falling asleep, the sleep onset and sleep maintenance, those that have difficulty staying asleep. So those two will be the focus for today. So how are we going to focus on them? Well, we have a handful of pharmacologic targets that we can use for sleep. Um, our main inhibitory neurotransmitter, the gamma aminobutyric acid, our GABA, uh, is gonna be one of the main ones for a handful of medications that we'll use. Um, orexin, which is a new neuropeptide, which seems to promote wakefulness. Um, these are some of the newest agents related to sleep that are available on the market. Um, kind of the new kid on the block, so it's exciting that we've diversified a little bit. Melatonin, um, as well as the role of histamine. Um, so looking at how our antihistamine medications might play a role for patients with insomnia. I could not in good faith, even though I am a pharmacist, um, and our focus is on the drugs, sometimes the focus with the drugs is when are they not appropriate? What are the limitations that we have with them? Some of the limitations that we have with treatment of insomnia is the fact that these really um, can help with the symptoms of insomnia, but may not necessarily provide long-term benefit. Um, so additional things that patients can do that might have a much more robust response include some non-pharmacologic treatments. So sleep hygiene for absolutely every patient. Um, this was a graphic that I found on a New Zealand uh, public health site. I liked it because it separated the sleep hygiene recommendations into before bedtime, getting ready for bedtime, and then during sleep. Um, so encouraging the patients to think about what they're doing during the day. 
What does their caffeine intake look like? Their nicotine intake, how much alcohol are they ingesting on a regular basis? As all of those can be disruptive to sleep. Avoiding large or really heavy meals right before they expect to go to sleep and encouraging physical activity, but if we can space it out uh, from when they want to go to sleep, that would be best. There is an exception with, with yoga. Um, if patients are doing yoga and it tends to be um, not one of the incredibly rigorous routines, that actually can help them set up their body to be ready to go to sleep. Um, so that might be the only exception there. Encouraging the patients to set a schedule, to stay on that schedule, regardless of whether it's during the week or on the weekends, having a routine so that they know that they're getting ready for bed um, and their body can start adjusting to that. That may also include starting to um, transition away from technology. Um, I have a 12-year-old and a 14-year-old, and one of the things that we've tried to institute is about a half an hour before they're going to bed, I let them know, hey guys, you got about a half hour left and I want them to transition off of their screens. Um, so if they are on their Nintendo Switch or the iPad or whatever they might be doing, that's the time I want them to put that away and start to transition to something else. Um, whether it's reading, whether it's playing games with us, but just really starting to do something different. Reducing um, in their bedroom itself, making it a comfortable environment. So the lighting, the temperature, just making sure it's, it's a place that's really comfortable, maybe a little bit on the cool side for the patients, uh, as well as trying to reduce external noise. Although um, having like a white noise machine or an air purifier in the background may, may be helpful for some individuals. Encouraging um, folks that when they go to bed, um, if they're not able to fall asleep right away, that they do get up and go do something else relaxing. Um, so if it's been about 20 minutes and they're not able to get to sleep, that they do go do something, uh, something else. And that when they're in bed, the bed is really reserved for intimacy and sleep. Uh, we're not doing other things in bed. You're not searching on your phone. You're not reading in bed. Um, you're not watching TV. So encouraging them to really restrict the activities that are there so their mindset can be, when we're here, this really is for, for sleep or intimacy only. With those things, the sleep hygiene and the cognitive behavioral therapy, which oftentimes incorporates those, I want to point this out specifically because their efficacy outcomes are equal to the medications we're about to talk about for acute treatment of insomnia. They can be equally as effective. Long term for chronic insomnia, they actually appear to be superior. More patients will have response and potentially and maintain remission if they're utilizing these interventions. So a lot of that lifestyle changes may be beneficial for the patients much more long term, as well as the psychoeducation. So as individuals get older, they don't need quite as much sleep. So helping reset um, some of the expectations can be really helpful. So I didn't think you'd be complete without, without having that on there, but we're gonna focus on the meds now. So here are the classes of medications that we're going to discuss. And we are gonna go step by step. Um, most of these medications have placebo controlled trials. One thing I do want to point out, similar to depression or anxiety trials, there's a pretty robust placebo response. There was a, a systematic review done that analyzed 32 different studies with just under 4,000 patients. And about 60% of the patients on placebo had a response in their insomnia symptoms. And interestingly, it was not just a subjective response where maybe they thought they were taking a sleep medicine, so I'm going to say that I'm sleeping better. They actually saw improvement on the polysom the polysomnography. So when they did their sleep studies, they saw improvements in their sleep efficacy, even for those placebo patients. So sometimes those expectations really can be met if they think that a pill is going to help them. That's one of the things I'm going to bring back uh, a little bit later on with one of the medications that um, the guidelines say has questionable efficacy, because if there is such a robust placebo response and maybe a psychological component, that might be able to play a role there. For these recommendations, um, 
they are based on the clinical practice guidelines from the American Academy of Sleep Medicine. So here is the citation for um, where these came from, with one exception, and I'll point it out when we get there. So our first class, so the benzodiazepines and non-benzodiazepine receptor agonists. So these are going to be the agents that target the GABA receptor. So main inhibitory neurotransmitter, we increase that inhibitory um, activity, we actually can see an improvement in sleep. Barbiturates also have a binding site here on the GABA receptor. They are not recommended for sleep. They can make patients drowsy. However, tolerance to the sedative effects tends to happen relatively quickly. And there is some concern about safety, especially if it's taken in conjunction with other CNS depressants. So for our benzodiazepines, the guidelines um, called out specifically triazolam and temazepam. So triazolam being a shorter acting benzodiazepine, um, it's recommended for treatment of sleep onset. So for those that have difficulty getting to sleep, the temazepam has a little bit of a longer half-life and that one's recommended for treatment of sleep onset and sleep maintenance. Um, we're, I included some specific evidence a little later on, but I did want to call out the temazepam. This one tends to have one of the most robust responses um, when we look at those efficacy outcomes, so it really can be quite effective for the patients. Obviously, misuse um, or diversion of these medications, as well as the potential to develop tolerance may really limit um, how frequently we utilize these meds. The other GABA-related class is our non-benzodiazepine receptor agonists. Um, so the Z drugs, so azopiclone, zolepilon, and zolpidem. So for azopiclone and zolpidem, both for onset and maintenance, they last a little bit longer. We could use them for both of them. So for the zolepilon, that one's just a little bit shorter acting for sleep onset. There have been reports and there's evidence of patients who repeat the dose if they need help with sleep maintenance. Um, that was not recommended by the treatment guidelines. So yes, it can be done, um, but maybe more if that happens really intermittently, that one really more would be a better fit if it's reserved for patients who just have trouble falling asleep. Our second class is the orexin receptor inhibitors. Um, I split these a little bit. So orexin is one of the wake promoting neuropeptides. Um, so a little bit more recent development. Um, and these medications actually block the receptors that the orexin works on. Um, so they sit on those receptors and block the activity. So if we're blocking the wakefulness, um, then hopefully that can help promote sleep. And that is what we tend to see. So we have two medications in this class, Sorexavit, so for, I'm having such a hard time talking here. Um, Suvarexant um, is Belsamra. That's the first one that was approved in this class. It's recommended for, the, for treatment of sleep maintenance. Um, so in the clinical trials, it did decrease the total sleep time as well as decrease the amount of time that patients were awake after they had fallen asleep. Um, so significantly better than placebo, we saw some improvement within the first, within the first month of therapy. Did, while there are some reports that it can help with sleep onset, it really wasn't a robust response, especially when they um, pooled the data from the clinical trials. Our other agent in this class is lemorexant. Um, so this is the um, DeVigo newer approved agent. This one was not included in the treatment guidelines, um, but I did just wanna include some evidence here for you. Its official FDA approval is for patients who have insomnia with difficulty falling asleep or staying asleep. As you can see, it did have some significant improvement um, in sleep onset. So patients were able to fall asleep faster um, then the patients that were on placebo, so the blue lines are placebo, and then um, the red lines in the middle are five milligram, the green lines are the 10 milligram tablets. And then wake time after sleep onset, so that sleep maintenance, we see a much more robust response. So similar to the other agent, it may be that this ends up being recommended for sleep maintenance um, because the difference in sleep onset for the um, 
silverexin was about four minutes. And as we see here, this is about five to six minutes. So when they start to look at all of the clinical trials, they will have to see if that actually statistically separates from placebo or not. So maybe it's a little bit of an advantage, but not clinically significant. Um, but it does carry that, that approval at this time. So an interesting other group, those three classes of medications are the ones that are really targeted for patients with um, insomnia alone. As we move into these next three classes of medications, we're gonna see that the um, robustness of the recommendation falls off pretty significantly. All of the top three classes are controlled substances. So there is some concern regarding misuse, diversion, um, or abuse of those medications. For those that are in the bottom three boxes, um, we don't have those same concerns. So for patients that may have a substance use disorder history, we may be looking a little bit faster at these three boxes here at the bottom. Our melatonin agonists, so this would include the melatonin products that are available over the counter, as well as the remelteon, which is our prescription product. So these are agonists at the melatonin receptors. So melatonin being the chemical compound that um, starts being produced as the daylight starts to decrease, which now, at least here in Ohio, we start to lose daylight relatively quickly, five, six o'clock, we're getting dark, um, to signal the body that it's time for bed. So this gives an extra boost or sedation signal. In the treatment guidelines, melatonin was not recommended for patients with chronic insomnia. Remelteon was recommended just for sleep onset. But with that caveat, there may be a role for agents like melatonin in patients who do have some difficulty, but maybe it's not as robust or they're not candidates for those other medications, um, those controlled substance medications that we just talked about. Additionally, melatonin can play a role for patients that may have circadian rhythm disorders. So patients who are jet lag, patients that may work, um, they may work second or third shift and have difficulty sleeping there. Um, so all of those are potential areas where we can see benefit. It's not from a toxicity standpoint, melatonin doesn't have a significant amount of toxicity and they're starting to look at its role in potentially reducing oxidative stress in patients and thinking that maybe it can be helpful in patients that are suffering other things. So they have anxiety, they have depression, um, they still need additional assistance with sleep that this might be an option. So we're starting to see it in other places. It's also being used adjunctively in patients that um, as a preventative measure in patients with migraine headaches um, to take it at bedtime on a regular basis to help decrease the frequency of their migraine headaches. So I don't think that um, even though it's not recommended at this time, I don't think the whole story has been told on melatonin products yet. Our antidepressants are a really diverse group. So we can see improvement in sleep by altering some of the neurotransmitters, serotonin and norepinephrine mainly, but dopamine may play a role as well. Most of the sed sedating antidepressants also have some antihistamine activity. Um, so almost an additional boost by blocking the histamine receptors. And we're gonna talk about that class last. So the ones that are called out um, most commonly are mirtazapine, trazodone, and our tricyclic antidepressants. Of these, the mirtazapine and the amitriptyline are not included in the treatment guidelines. So the doxepin and the trazodone are. Doxepin recognized for treatment of sleep maintenance and trazodone for onset and maintenance. Um, even though the amitriptyline and the mirtazapine are not recommended for insomnia alone, they may play a role for patients that have depression, that have anxiety or post-traumatic stress disorder. So it may be um, possible to be assisting in treating the insomnia while also co-treating one of the other comorbid conditions. So not necessarily that they're completely off the table, but maybe not for a patient who only has chronic insomnia. Our last class are the antihistamines. So this is the class that was not included in the chronic um, insomnia treatment guidelines. 
So we have a few different agents within this class. So diphenhydramine and doxylamine are available over the counter. And then we have our hydroxyzine. So all of them are antagonists at the histamine one receptor and they have some anticholinergic activity as well. They've been found to be effective in decreasing sleep latency and increasing total sleep time. So they can help a patient get to sleep and stay asleep uh, a little bit better. But there is a concern about tolerance. So it's advised that patients are using them for three nights and then taking a break and, and reevaluating whether or not their insomnia is still present. If they do continue to use it and they're using it for 10 consecutive nights, at that point, we do need to do some reevaluation of if another treatment is going to be appropriate because it's unlikely that it will continue to be effective for their insomnia as they get into that two week mark. So, yes, it can be effective, but in a different patient population than what we saw with those other prescription products. So because that was a lot of information, I included a couple summary tables. Um, so sleep hygiene for everybody, recipe for everybody, we all should be following that. For sleep onset, here were the medications just listed in alphabetical order, as well as the amount of sleep latency change that we saw compared to placebo. Um, so as you can see, there's a significant variability of how much faster patients on these medications fell asleep compared to placebo, with the temazepam really being kind of the, the all-out winner with patients going to sleep almost 40 minutes earlier. And finally, for sleep maintenance, same thing. So these are listed in alphabetical order. Um, all have demonstrated efficacy in helping patients stay asleep. And then here is the quantification for the change in total sleep time, how much longer patients on these medications slept compared to those on placebo, and how much less they were awake after they went to sleep. Um, so awake after sleep onset, how much time were they awake? All of these are negative because they were awake less when they were taking the medication compared to the placebo. And again, you're seeing differences between 10 minutes and a half an hour, which in a patient that may not be sleeping a ton, five or, five or six hours total, that might make a pretty significant difference. And Jamie has the slides that she'll be able to distribute. 